I've been praying for a while now on uh, just an opportunity to be able to uh, share a message that uh, just really lays out God's design uh, all in uh, one uh, talk. Uh, and uh, I want to do that out of Genesis uh, 1 and 2. And, and I want to do it in a way where it's not against what's wrong with the world uh, or identifying faulty designs, faulty ideas, or sinful things that are going on uh, in our culture. I just wanted to lay out uh, the beauty of what God has done uh, and just let it rest on us. Uh, and my hope in this will be that, and my prayer has been, uh, that for those who believe this, that it will be refreshing for you to hear it. Uh, and that uh, it would cause uh, your love for God uh, to grow today and to increase uh, because of His design and allowing us to be a part of it. I also believe that with the way our culture is rolling today, that it's really easy for someone that's solid in their faith in Christ to drift uh, and to end up uh, buying into cultural ideas that are not God's design. Uh, and so my hope today would be as you hear afresh uh, God's design that if you've begun to drift as a Christian, uh, that this might be a re-anchoring today uh, inside of uh, God's design. Uh, and then I also recognize in messages like this that uh, it will disturb some people, uh, and it will not be something that you agree with when you hear it. It will strike your ears wrong. Uh, and this is what I would ask. It's, it's kind of odd here. Uh, there are times when I'm preaching, and I'll talk about issues that are hard issues, uh, and I'll, just, I'll watch people get up and leave. And I know it's not because they're going to get coffee or going to the bathroom or uh, you got a soccer game. Uh, and so I would just ask on a message like this uh, that if you disagree with something enough where it makes you angry and you want to just get up and leave, uh, what I'm hoping is is that our church can be one of the safest places to talk about hard topics. And that we could actually learn to sit across from each other and have conversation about things of which we disagree. And that we could look at the scriptures and say, look, this is the way we understand it and why. Let's talk about how you've arrived at where you are. And we might walk away disagreeing in it. But, but wouldn't that just be healthy if we could have real dialogues around things about which we disagree, if our life groups this week would be so lively with conversation around the things that are stirred this morning. And so that would be my hope. So I would just ask that if you can, uh, that you would stay for the whole message. Now, I said this in the, in the service before this one, and some people were scrambling at the end because they actually needed to go to the bathroom and didn't feel like they could. If you need to go to the bathroom, go. You don't have to be miserable the whole time in here. I, I didn't realize the impact of, of what that would, that would do. So uh, I'll just trust that you're going to the bathroom and you're coming back. I'll look the other way. I won't draw attention to you. How's that? That'd be fair. Uh, and so I just hope that we can have uh, that kind of a conversation around uh, the kinds of things that God uh, has invited us into in His design. And, and just know that anything outside of this design would be a miss of what God's very best is and would actually take us down a path uh, that is not uh, helpful. I also understand today uh, that depending on your life experience, uh, that there is pain and wounds and hurts. Uh, and I just want you to know I know that. Uh, and as I share these things, again, I just want to lay the message out without contrasting it to other things. I just want the goodness of God's design to rest on us. But please know, I, I know there's things that are painful as you hear them uh, that might be difficult. And those would be the kinds of things we'd actually want to have conversation about uh, later. The other night I was listening to uh, Jen Wilkin, who's a fantastic ladies uh, Bible study teacher, and, uh, and she said something at the outset before she was talking, I thought, I love that, uh, and I'm going to say the same thing. Uh, if there is not a respect for God, there will not be a respect for God's design and God's Word. And she started the other night, what I was listening to, uh, Psalm 111.10, uh, 
Uh, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And she said, you know, that really struck me. It's not the, the love of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom, she said. But it's the fear of the Lord. It's an awe and a reverence and a respect for Him that is the beginning of wisdom. And that's been one of my prayers as well, is that, that we would have such a respect for God that we can't do anything but respect His design and then walk in that design and the beauty of it. The other thing that I wanted us to wrap this around as I've prayed on it uh, comes from the title of a chapter uh, in this book by C.J. Mahaney. It's called Sex, Romance, and the Glory of God. And the subtitle is What Every Christian Husband Needs to Know. It's a fantastic book, and it's a, a very healthy, uh, celebratory uh, kind of thinking from God's perspective on sex uh, inside of the marriage relationship. Uh, and then in the last chapter, his wife Carolyn writes it, and the title of the chapter is The Pleasure of Purity. When I read that, I thought, I can't wait to do a message that the theme is The Pleasure of Purity. Because that's what I think about when I think about God's design. That not just sex from this particular book, but just the whole of God's design, that there's pleasure in it and it's pure. In Psalm 1611, the psalmist writes, he says, You'll make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. God is a God of pleasure. And all of us, at the end of the day, are pleasure seekers. We desire pleasure. The reason we desire pleasure is because that's who God is. He's a God of pleasure. And we want to seek that pleasure inside of God's plan and the joy that He offers to us. So I want us to think about that idea, the pleasure of purity, uh, as we think about a few categories uh, inside of God's design. And I want to begin by thinking about creation. And now what we see in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, where we'll hang out, at the very beginning, it's in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now one thing I love about the way God laid His Word out to us is He didn't intend this to be a science book. What the scriptures do is answer the question, who and why? Who? Science is not designed to answer that question, nor is it designed to answer the question, why? The Bible answers the question, who? And it's answered in this very first verse, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Who? Who is the creator? God is the creator. And then we see unfolding in the pages of scriptures, why? And it's for his glory, and for his honor. So we see the who and the why. There's no reason that science and the Bible have to conflict. They actually complement. Because science helps us discover how things were, were done and what those things are and the detail of those things. And that, what that ought to do is just create in us more and more of an awe of God who created for his own glory. So we see in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew, and God is the subject of the very first sentence, and he will be the central subject of the rest of the story. And the Hebrew word for God in verse 1 is Elohim. Elohim is a plural word. We see at the very outset, God is described as the triune God. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, we're told that it was, it was Christ who's the one uh, that by all things were created, both in the heavens and the earth, visible and invisible, or thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Jesus Christ, present in creation, the agent by which things were created. In, in verse 2 of chapter 1, it says the Holy Spirit is hovering over all that is in that moment. So we just see at the very outset of the scripture that, that God is the very center and he's the triune God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, all involved in the creation. 
God created. That word created is the Hebrew word bara, uh, and it's only used with God. He, he's the one that creates this way, and it carries with it the idea of the power and the freedom of an artist to call into existence that which did not exist before. God created. He called into existence with his freedom and artistry and power that which did not exist before. God is the creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created all that is. He created in such a way that uh, the writer says to us that in six days, this is how he did it. Uh, On day one, he created night and day. He created night and day, day and night. This is the form that he's setting in place before he brings life to fill it. The form, day one, day and night, night and day. Day two, we see the expanse is created. And the expanse is that which is now between the waters. So it's the the heavens are created. So there's the waters above and the waters below. On day three is earth and vegetation. There's an order to who God is. There's a, a rationality to the way that he creates. On the first three days, he created the form so that there could be life to populate those forms. And he does it in that order of day and night, expanse, earth, and vegetation. And when he makes the vegetation, he makes the plants and the trees that will bear fruit after their own kind. Once he has the form in place, now he brings life to it. In day four, which if I could... Ask God, could, could I go back and just be a part of one of the days that you created? Which day would that be for you? I, I think for me, it would be day four. Because on day four, he put the, the moon to govern the night, and he put the sun to govern the day, and then he put the stars to blanket the skies. I, I was in South Texas at the end of last week at a, uh, a gathering, and Uh, And one of the things in South Texas is there's not a lot there, uh, but there is a a dark sky. And the the stars just blanketed uh, that canopy of black. And and God names every star that is there. The ones we see, the ones we don't see, they're His to enjoy. And we get to share that enjoyment with Him. But on day four, he populates what he did on day one when he said there's night and day or day and night. He populates that with the stars, the sun, and the moon. Day one and day four go together, form, and then you fill it with life. On day five, it says that uh, he puts the fish in the waters and he puts the birds in the sky. And when he does that, he's corresponding to day two where he had made the expanse. He had separated the waters so that there'd be a place for the birds and there would be a place for the fish. On day six is the land animals, the cattle, the creeping things, and the beasts, all after their kind. And then humans. Day six goes with day three, where the earth was set and the vegetation was set so now the humans could live in that which God created. Form and function, form and life. God's very orderly. It's beautiful in what he's created, what he's made. It's pleasure in what he's created. He says it's all good. It's beautiful to him. A little bit ago, Lisa and I went to an aquarium, uh, the Dallas Aquarium. We really need to have grandkids. We're just like a couple of kids. Uh, we, need to, we need to have grandkids to take with us. If you want to loan us some every once in a while, maybe we'll take them with us. But uh, here's an anteater, uh, and it's hard to tell that it's an anteater. I didn't get the best shot of it, but his, uh, 
the, the no, nose, whatever you call it, is coming off the bottom of the screen. But we were looking at it, at least at how creative God is, and it just looks like a walking carpet, uh, and he did. Uh, but can you imagine God's delight and pleasure when he made the anteater? I mean, who thinks that up? Uh, and then uh, we saw this bird, a toucan, uh, and the colors uh, on the toucan, and that's just one of however many that God has made. Can you imagine him just thinking through the birds and the different shapes and colors that he made? Uh, and then uh, here, uh, can you guess what that is? It's a manatee. Things about to blow up. Uh, as his, the, the face of him is down at the bottom uh, of the tank. It is a big manatee. Hey, there's my legs on the manatee. I just saw it. And, and the, yeah, the picture of the reflection. And then that shark, we actually thought maybe that was a big sticker. You know, it was those overhead uh, clear glass that you're looking at the, the fish. But that's a shark for real as we looked at him from the top as well. Uh, but just imagine the detail. That's just four of what God created uh, of, the, uh, of land animals, birds, and fish. Can you just imagine the delight? And the, for those of you that are artists and are creative, when you are, are able to create something that, uh, that wasn't there before, uh, there's just a, a thrill in that and a pleasure uh, in it. And <clears throat> that is what God created. It's a pleasure to Him. It's pure to Him. In Psalm 33, 6, it says, It's by the word of the Lord that the heavens were made. And then verse 9, he spoke and it was done. Can you imagine that power? He just spoke and it was. He spoke and it was done. Elohim, God. Barah, he created. It's the sole work of God to create that which was not in existence and to bring it into existence. And then the psalmist would write in 111.2, Greater the works of the Lord, they are studied by all who delight in them. We look at God's creation and His works, and, and we study them when we delight in them. Oh, there's a pleasure of purity. And God said all this was good. As He unfolds His design, on that sixth day He created... Humanity, but we see the uniqueness of humanity because male and female in the image of God, he created them. Verse 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created in verse 27, man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God explains it on that sixth day that he uniquely created humanity to be male and female in the image of God. This is God's design. It's a beautiful design. It's his pleasure and it's his pure design. There's been debate over time as to what the image of God means. I think someone defined it well when they said it's a, a, a representation of God who is like God in some respects, but not all respects. So, so we're image bearers. We're like God in some respects, but not all respects, meaning God is ever present. We're not like God in that way. God has all knowledge. We're not like God in that way. God has all wisdom. We're not like God in that way. But I think Wayne Grudem, a theologian, does a nice job of helping us think about ways that we are like God in the image of God. And he divides it into four categories. In the image of God, it's the morality. that There is a sense of right and wrong within each of us. And in that way, we are made in the image of God. There's an aesthetic part of the image of God, he says. Meaning that there is something in us that likes to create, and if we're not that great at creating, at least we appreciate beauty. God has created it. Everything He's made is beautiful. And in the same way, we recognize beauty. Now, what might be beautiful to you would be different to me and different to you, but that is part of being in the image of God. 
There's a mental aspect to being in the image of God. The ability to reason and logic. It's the reason we have philosophy and science and different disciplines. Because in the image of God, we can reason and be logical. And then there's a relational aspect to the image of God. Meaning we can relate to God and we can relate to one another. Those, that can be a, at least an idea of what the image of God is. And so God made us in the image of God, male and female. Now because we're made in the image of God, this is the reason that every person is a person of dignity and value. We value every person, the person. Because they're made in the image of God. This is the why behind why we value someone and dignify someone. And that dignity and value we learn later in Psalm 139 begins in the womb. In Psalm 139 verse 13 it says, You formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. We just found out not too long ago that my niece... Uh, is pregnant, uh, and at five and a half weeks, they were able to tell them the gender of that baby. In the womb of the mom, God has established a person made in his image, and he's weaving that person together, either male or female. I will give thanks to you, verse 14, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Now, Jen Wilkin was talking about this psalm the other night, the one I was listening to, and it was interesting what she said. She said, this is not a self-esteem psalm for women's conferences. This is a psalm about God. This is about what He's done. And he's the one that's formed us. He's the one that weaves us in the womb. And he's the one that receives our thanks. And and he's the one whose works are wonderful. And my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. God is the one who creates. God is the one who makes us in his image. He's the one that makes us male or female. He's the one that weaves us in our mother's womb. And he's the one that's established how many days that we'll receive. This is about God from start to finish. It's pleasurable and beautiful what he's created. In verse 28, he says, what we're to do as his unique image bearers, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, if you were in this service a week ago, you saw live uh, as we honored our our seniors, our graduates before sending them out. And one of the things that we ask them to do is write on a card or what's a way they want to make an impact later in life. And one young man said he wanted to be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> I thought it was the highlight of the day. That's a young man that understands God's design and he's ready to do his part. Well, God has established... His creation, he's uniquely made humanity in it, and he's told us what we're to do. And based in his creation, he has given us a work-rest rhythm. In verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. All all the work was done in six days. By the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Creation made the image of God, male and female, a work-rest rhythm. He unfolds this throughout Scripture. In Exodus 20, when he establishes his people, 
He tells them to work six days, rest on the Sabbath. And he bases it on the creation of six days, and then one day he rested. Now, what did he say about that seventh day? He completed his work, so he was done with his work. He rested on the seventh day, and then verse 3, he sanctified it. That word sanctified means he set it apart. It's a, it's a day that's different than the other six. Six of these days work. One of these days set it apart to rest. Now, the psalmist would later tell us that God doesn't sleep nor slumber. So what does his rest look like? Well, the word for rest here is the word cease. It's to cease from doing your normal work. So whatever is normal work on those other six days, then on the seventh day, cease from that work. And what God did is he said his work was very good that he did, which gives us the idea that part of what we do on that seventh day is savor what it is that happened in our work the previous six days. We reflect back on the work that was done. We remember, we rejoice, we reflect on that seventh day of rest. We work hard... For six, we rest deeply for one. Cease from that normal activity. And God gives the responsibility for that seventh day of rest on whoever is the leader of the home. They're responsible for rest for all they have the care over. This is God's design. There's a work-rest rhythm That's the rest part. But isn't it interesting that the work is established in Genesis 1 and 2 where everything is in perfect harmony. Work is not the curse. Work is good. This morning when I was at the gym uh, before coming to the 8 o'clock, I I usually time myself where I, I get here right on time. I shouldn't do that, but I do. And uh, and this morning, uh, I was leaving the gym, and there's a guy that works there that works really hard all the time. In all the years I've been there, this guy works hard. Uh, and so I'd been thinking about this a little bit, and when I was walking in the parking lot, he was out there doing some things, and I said, hey, thanks for being such a great example of hard work. And he said, you know, he said, I, I, I love to work. He said, I always have. He said, I don't know why I love to work. And I said, well, you're a great example. I got in the car and I thought, ah, you blew it. And I thought, no, I didn't. I can still go back to him. So I got in the car. I drove up next to him. I rolled the window down, passenger side. He comes over to the car and I said, hey, I want to tell you why you love to work hard. Because God designed us to work. And when you work hard... You're reflecting God. And that's God's pleasure. We best reflect God in our work when we work hard. Because he designed us with purpose to work. We're to work. And then he started telling me things. And and it just led to this long conversation. And I thought, I've got work to do at 8. I I need to wrap this up. Uh, I just wanted to affirm you and that God is, uh, that, that you're reflecting God in your work today. Uh, it was a great conversation. God designed us to work. In chapter 2, verse 15, we see that with, with Adam. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. His first work was to cultivate and take care of that which God made, which is exactly what we see in chapter 1, verse 28, uh, that we're to care for what he's made. Creation. Made in the image of God, male and female. Work, rest, rhythm. All the foundational ways we're to live life are set in the get-go. And then marriage, at the end of chapter 2, is set in God's design. 
Verse 18, the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper suitable for him. Earlier in chapter 2, he had formed the man out of the dust. He breathed life into him. But it was him and then all the rest of God's creation. And when we arrive at verse 18, the Lord said, look, it's not good for the man to be alone. He's by himself. There's not uh, another part of his creation uh, that is suitable for him. He said, I'm going to make him a helper suitable for him. The word helper here is a Hebrew word, ezer. And when you see that word used throughout the Old Testament, the majority of the time it's used where God is our helper. It's a strong word, and it's what God does. He says, I'm going to make you a helper. It also has a military idea to it, kind of a warrior mentality, being a help that way when it's used in other places. So God said, I'm going to make you a helper. And this will be one who supplies strength where you lack. So God designed this in such a way that that for Adam, the first man, there would be a woman for him that would be a strength where he lacked. That she would be suitable for him. That word suitable means fit for him. A fit companion for him. It's a beautiful design that God is laying out. Linda Dillo has written a book called Creative Counterpart. And I try to read things that on occasion that are for women so that I can understand uh, more how women relate to women and how they think about some of these things. And Linda Dillow has been a big help to me uh, over the years. She's, she's really fantastic in the things she writes. Uh, but uh, in this Creative Counterpart book, she, she describes the helper that is Genesis 2.18 as being the creative counterpart to her husband. And, and I just want to read a little bit what she says Uh, about this idea of being a helper. God's plan for marital happiness involves a spiritual head and a creative counterpart. Instead of competing with each other and complaining to each other, God's man and God's woman complete each other. A creative counterpart is a helpmate, a compliment to her husband. She not only allows her husband to be the leader, but also encourages him to take the leadership by reverencing him and by being submissive to him. She's chosen to be submissive because God has commanded it and because she's convinced that only completion will result in a vital and fulfilling marriage. The role of helpmate indicates not a status of inferiority, but a functional difference. The wife is in submission to her husband in the same way that Christ is in submission to the Father. Yet Christ and the Father are equal in one. There cannot be two leaders. The purpose is functional teamwork that allows two people to complement each other, not compete with each other in life. Women sometimes say, don't say submission so loudly. I hope to show you that submission is not a dirty word, but your hope of becoming all that God intended and all that you desire. Christ is subject to God. He's equal to God. He's very God, but he's subject to the Father. Jesus, creator of heaven and earth, submitted himself to God and took his place in the chain of authority. It's no shame or dishonor for a wife to be under authority if the Lord Jesus was. Each marriage partner has a blessed, unique responsibility, a purpose in life that the other cannot possibly fulfill and cannot happily exist without. And then she says, The passage on submission, which is in Ephesians 5, Sounds as if our husbands got together and wrote it, doesn't it? They didn't. God did. Please note that God does not say your husband has earned the right to be your head or has deserved it. He says that he, God, decided this was the best plan and therefore asks you to honor the plan. God had many plans available to him and he chose this one. Believe it or not, it's to your advantage. 
This is God's design. There's pleasure in the purity of God's design. He goes on to describe uh, how he forms the woman. He puts the man in a deep sleep, and then he takes a rib out of him, and he forms and fashions the woman. Now, there's a little phrase in verse 22 that until a few years ago I had not picked up on. And it says this, it's the last part of verse 22, that the Lord God, he brought her to the man. He, he fashioned her and then he brought her to the man. And then there was pure elation from him and his response to God bringing her to him. This is what happens on a wedding day when the bride is brought to her husband. There's pure elation on that day. And that's what God does here. He brings her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. She's a part of me. And then for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. And, and they shall become one flesh. So a man should leave his father and mother. He's setting this up for how this should flow from now on. And, and the man is to be joined to his wife. That word joined is, is like a glue. There's to be an unbreakable bond between the husband and the wife. And they shall become one flesh. That when that bond is formed, when the marriage is consummated, they become one flesh. There is a oneness that God establishes between a man and a woman in marriage. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Isn't that an intriguing verse to put in there? Why, why would he put that there? I think it has to do with trust. A man and a woman are not any more vulnerable than when they're naked before each other. And when he set up his design in the marriage relationship, it's a relationship that is an unbreakable bond, a oneness, a sacredness, and a trust between the two. Later, God would call this a covenant, a covenant that's not to be broken. This is God's design. That oneness that he talks about from a sexual side to celebrate, there is a pleasure in the purity of the way God designed sex within marriage. In the Bible, in the Song of Songs, eight chapters about the middle of our Bibles, all of a sudden there's this, this book of the Bible that is celebrating an erotic, sexual, satisfying, pleasurable relationship between a husband and a wife. It's God's design to be enjoyed inside the marriage relationship. The pleasure of purity inside that relationship, both husband and wife enjoying each other romantically, sexually, relationally. That's God's design. It's a beautiful design. Well, Jesus would go on to anchor himself in Genesis 2, these last few verses, to solidify the idea of marriage between a man and a woman in Matthew 19, verses 4 and following. The Apostle Paul would do the same thing in Ephesians chapter 5, and it's an amazing chapter of Scripture in chapter 5 because we actually see the unfolding of why God designed marriage the way he did. See, God has purpose in everything that he does from the very beginning. And while we may not always understand his purposes, there are purposes behind what he does. And when he established marriage in this uh, first part of his creation, he had an intention for it that Paul writes in Ephesians 5 that's a mind-blowing thought that in marriage it actually represents Jesus Christ and the church. And he lays out what that looks like in Ephesians 5, 22 and following. 
It says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. This carries on that idea of being the helper. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. God is a rational and orderly God. And God is the head of Christ, Paul writes. And Christ is the head of humanity, he writes. And the husband is the head of the wife. The husband is not the head of every woman. The husband is the head of his wife. And then the parents together are the authority over their children. This is God's order and his design. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be their husbands in everything. Because wives get the privilege of representing the bride of Christ, the church, in the marriage relationship. And as the church, what do we do? We gladly, voluntarily, and joyfully yield to and submit to Christ, our head, as the church. And the wife represents the church in the marriage relationship. Now, I can't remember a wedding that I've done where I don't look at the man right in the eye after I talk about this part to say, your job's harder Because verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Your job as the husband is to represent Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ gladly gave his life up for the church. He sacrificed, served, looked for the best interests of the church so that we could thrive. I've yet to meet a wife who will not gladly yield to and follow a husband that's willing to lay his life down, sacrifice, and serve her. That's a beautiful picture of Christ in the church. That's God's design, that we would represent him. Verse 32, he said, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. So this this is a mystery, and now it's being unfolded. Now we know this is why God set this up this way. And nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. A pleasure of purity to represent Christ and the church. In the marriage relationship. Well, what if you're single? How does this work? Well, if I'm single and alone and I don't have a helper fit for me yet, or maybe that won't be God's design. Well, Paul addresses that in Ephesians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And note that Jesus is single and Paul is single. In 1 Corinthians 7, he advocates for marriage. He said that's a good thing. Uh, But then he goes on to say, actually, if you could restrain from it, that's even better. In verse 35, and the reason it's better is because you can have undistracted devotion to the Lord. And I think one of the greatest gifts I've seen over time is people who are single, who've made the most of their singleness with their undistracted devotion in following the Lord. Say, well, that doesn't take care of the aloneness. Well, God has designed the Christian community to be the richest community so that that aloneness is taken care of. It's on us as a church to have the best community for someone that's single so that there's a richness in that Christian community to take care of the aloneness. This is God's design. It's a pure design, and there's pleasure in it. Now, the problem is we get outside of that design. And we look for all kinds of ways to talk about who the Creator is, we talk about the way it happened. Uh, we, we, We try to have new designs on everything that God 
created himself. We look for pleasure in ways that we see again and again don't bring joy and don't bring pleasure. So we're in a broken world. So it's nice to lay out the design, but what do I do about that? Because the reality is most of our world is not living in this design. Well, God, in his pursuing and wooing of us, in his love for us, even when we don't respect him, he still pursues us. And God took the full brunt of his displeasure over the impurity of our sin. God placed all of that on Christ on the cross so that we might be able to re-enter the design. He made a way for us to get back inside the design when we get outside of it. And the way he made it possible is through Jesus Christ. In John 10, 10, Jesus said, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they might have life, might have it abundantly. Jesus was gladly and willingly uh, following the will of his father to provide a way because there's a thief that's trying to steal and rob and kill us. But he gave us a way back into the joy and the pleasure. And Jesus said the abundant life. There's an abundant life that he's invited us into. And the way that we respond to that, Paul writes it in Acts chapter 3, uh, verse 19. And the way we respond is to repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away, nor that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So there is a way for refreshment to come. It's the way of repentance. It's the way of a godly sorrow over our sin our brokenness, and our desire to create our own design rather than walking in the beauty and pleasure of God's design. He's made a way for us. It's the way of repentance. For the person who has entered into the design, entered into life in Christ, and we find ourselves drifting, repentance is the way back. It's not a uh, a, a starting uh, as if I don't have the relationship, it's, it's repenting of living wrongly in the relationship with Jesus. But repentance is the way into the design. And look at the beauty of what Jesus did to restore everything that's broken about Genesis 1 and 2. We talked about creation. And every time a person says yes to Jesus, that person becomes a new creation in their heart. At the end of Revelation, the writer says that Jesus is coming back and he'll make all things new. So we're pointed towards a new creation and a new earth. Genesis 1 and 2, when you read that in your Bible, if you read Revelation 21 and 22, it's a new creation and a new heavens. It's restoring Genesis 1 and 2. So everything I've talked about today, the pleasure, the purity of what God's design is, one day we'll be back inside the perfect purity of it. Jesus will make all things new. In the meantime, he makes our hearts new, and we're moving towards that newness, the image of God. Our ideas of beauty, our thinking capacities, our relationships, all those aspects of what it is to be in the image of God that are broken. One of my seminary professors said years ago, the reality is we're subhuman once we've entered into sin. We actually become human again. When the image of God is restored within us through Christ. So that image of God, it's made right. 
in Christ. We can think clearly again. We can see what real beauty is and appreciate it. We can, uh, we can relate well because we're moving in a relationship out of, with Christ. Image God. Jesus takes care of that. The work, Jesus finished the work for us on the cross. He said it's finished. It's done. The work is done. He did the work for us. And then he rested. And Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Our rest today is found in Jesus. And now whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. We're his workmanship. He's working on us while we work. Jesus is the substance for that. And then marriage. We're called the bride of Christ. So every person that is a new creation in Christ is a part of the bride of Christ. It's a permanent, secure, unbreakable, sacred relationship of oneness in him. And he invites us all who are in Christ, in his new creation, to the marriage supper of the Lamb where we'll feast forever with the one who is our groom and our king. That's God's pure design. He's inviting us all into it. And that's where the greatest pleasure will come. What does that do to your heart today? Does it stir it with gratitude? Does it affirm how you already think? You say, I can't believe that God has let me be a part of this. Does it cause more gratitude, more love for him? Is there parts of that that when you hear it, you're thinking, uh, yeah, I don't know with where I'm walking. I don't think that really jives. Is God kind of bringing you back to re-anchor into his design. This is his idea. Or are you seething and you're just hoping this will hurry and end because you don't want to hear one more thing about it? Gosh, I hope you'd be willing to have a conversation about it. And we have this good dialogue. I hope this week that our life groups are just filled with lively dialogue. That again, we'll be the safest place to have the hardest conversations. That it's even among Christians that when you don't see something the same, that you can get in there and say, you know what? I hear this. I don't know how that works. I've chosen today to not give you a lot of practical thoughts underneath the big ideas. But what does this even look like day to day? Those would be great conversations this week. I just wanted to see in one, one time God's big design and the pleasure and the purity of that design. Father, thank you for uh, your goodness towards us that you would uh, lay out for us your purposes. Uh, and Father, I pray that where each of us are today that you meet us. And, and God, I pray where... Uh, we just see this, that you would cause our hearts to erupt with joy. Pray, God, where we've drifted, will you draw us back? Father, for someone that doesn't know Christ, I pray, as they listen to your design, that they just hear that and think, gosh, that's got to be better than what I'm in right now, because this sure doesn't seem to be producing a joy and a pleasure. Pray, Father, where there's disagreement, we help us, God, to know how to have real conversations with each other. And I pray, God, we just have a respect and a love, a value for you, and a gratitude that in your grace you would just pour on us your pursuit and your love and your drawing in to be a part of what you're doing. I pray we'll walk in freedom today, in joy and pleasure that you bring in your presence. So thank you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Let's, if we can, let's be quiet just for a moment. And whatever this stirs in you today, uh, let this be a time to solidify that, whether it's gratitude or whether it's 
hey, you know what, I want to talk about this particular thing with someone, or, you know what, I totally disagree with this, and I'd love to have a conversation about that. Well, whatever it would be, get settled now on what you'll do with it, and, uh, and then we'll look forward uh, to what that is. But let's, let's just be quiet for a moment.